Should we move now to the uh, session three uh, about the epithelial ovarian cancer? We'll start by uh, Dr. Karima Kuala, uh, medical oncologist uh, from Morocco. She will talk about genetic testing and counseling in a limited resource setting. Thank you for the introduction. I uh, would like to thank, first of all, uh, for Basil Rifki, especially my dear friend and brother, for the kind invitation. And it's always a big pleasure for me to be here in Egypt. Uh, well, I was asked to talk about genetic testing in ovarian cancer. Well, this question is fine, despite I'm not a genetician, I'm not a fundamentalist, I'm a medicologist. But to talk about this in the setting of limited resources countries is a bit uh, complex. Well, um, I think with the, the, the previous talk with the, my dear friend Dr. Uh, Ahmed, so we had a good background to introduce this topic of genetic testing and I will not remind you that ovarian cancer is a, uh, is a huge problem uh, being the most lethal gynecological cancer worldwide uh, in Morocco too, so uh, it's responsible of more than 300,000 deaths in Morocco. And uh, unfortunately, we still receive patients at the diagnosis at advanced stage, which is stage three and stage four. And we know that uh, the prognosis is uh, very closely uh, correlated to the stage of diagnosis. And for those advanced stages, we need very efficient, very effic uh, I mean, great uh, treatment with a high efficacy in order to improve this prognosis. That's why we are trying to understand more and more the biology of those tumors in order to detect or to have drivers to better design the treatment. So I choose to start with uh, uh, showing you the risk of developing ovarian cancer based on uh, some drivers. And as you know, uh, if, if in general population it's low, 1.3%. So for women who are BRCA mutated, so specifically BRCA1, this uh, uh, rate of uh, developing ovarian cancer uh, reach up to 40% uh, in, in those women, which means that is uh, really very important also to uh, determine those patients at high risk of developing ovarian cancer because in limited resources like our countries, I think prevention is the best way to be, uh, I mean, uh, cost effective. Also, uh, I wanted just to mention, since we are talking about this part of hereditary uh, ovarian cancer, we have some uh, known syndromes that you know all the, the, the breast and ovarian cancer syndrome. So we have the BRCA1, BRCA2, who are, which are the most prevalent drivers to look on uh, uh, in ovarian cancer. But we should also know that we have many, many other biomarkers, many other mutations like the one you see here, the RAD51, the, the CHECK2, the PULP2, etc. without also ignoring uh, the, 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 uh, the assessment of micro satellite and stability in the mid-match repair that also may be at risk of developing uh, uh, ovarian cancer. So, uh, first of all, I think when we want to treat uh, an ovarian cancer, we should know that we don't deal with one disease. It's at least five distinct diseases. So we will be focusing more in epithelial ovarian cancer since it's here where we have uh, uh, data and we have better understanding of the biomolecular uh, events and the signaling pathways that are involved in carcinogenesis and cancer progression. So uh, already for us as limited resources countries, I think we should uh, orient or guide more our, more our testings in this part of ovarian cancer which is epithelial. And you know also that uh, depending or um, by subtypes of epithelial uh, ovarian cancer, so we have many subtypes and each subtype has its own uh, molecular alterations. So we will be focusing more high-grade serous carcinoma and I think this is also um, I think a good idea because if, we, if I have limited possibility of testing, I should guide it more to this uh, high-grade serous carcinoma. Well, once again, so when you look and when you dissect in more details those different subtypes of ovarian cancer, you can see that on biomolecular level, it's very different from, uh, uh, from, can, from subtype to subtypes. In the high-grade serous carcinoma, it's here where we have almost all cancers are P P53 mutated and high rate also of BRCA mutations. 
Well, uh, my uh, colleague and friend, Dr. Ahmad, already talked about this, how is BRCA1, BRCA2 mutations are uh, crucial uh, in the repair of DNA double stand breaks. So you can see that you have uh, BRCA1 that has a major role in different steps, uh, and uh, the BRCA2 also, so in this uh, um, uh, uh, gene uh, double stand breaks. So, also, what we should know that for BRCA mutations, we can have both the germline mutations and the somatic mutations. The germline mutations are the ones that are constitutional, that are uh, uh, hereditary, so that we, we have them in all body cells, and we have the somatic mutations that are found in the tumor, uh, in the tumor tissue. And it was already shown uh, uh, in previous talk that we can have up to 50% of ovarian cancers that harbor uh, an HR. So uh, uh, homologous recombination deficiency that can be determined or seen in BRCA mutations. So germline in 14% uh, uh, or uh, somatic insects percent. So making up to 20% of BRCA mutations. But we don't have only BRCA mutations. We do have also other mechanisms like BRCA methylations, um, uh, um, uh, some other uh, pitan loss, and other HRD mechanisms. So I think this is mainly to underline that in all your ovarian, epithelial ovarian cancer, you have up to 50% or a bit more of uh, uh, those HRD that should be tested and should be detected because they can guide your uh, treatment decision. So what is also the prognostic value of this testing? So if I have a BRCA1 mutation in, in my patient, what does it mean for, for me at a prognostic level? It means already that the patients who are BRCA mutated have better survival, you can see here in the curves, than the one with non-BRCA mutations. And if we go more in details, you see that the BRCA2 have even slight better prognosis comparing to BRCA1 mutations. Now, we do know that we have 50% of ovarian cancer that should be tested that can be HRD positive with BRCA mutations or other mutations. But how should we do this testing? And what are the, the, the platforms that are available and specifically how can we adapt this to our context of limited resources countries? So you can see here that we can go uh, uh, through different testing. So we have the BRCA analysis that is really oriented and uh, the, I mean uh, uh, focusing on only BRCA mutations. And here you can assess only germline BRCA uh, mutations. You have the foundation uh, dedicated also to BRCA where you can detect both germline and somatic BRCA mutations, but only BRCA mutations. And you have the foundation uh, uh, focus uh, BRCA LOA where you can have both an idea about the mutation germline and somatic on BRCA, but also the LOH, and the largest one, which is the MITROS HRD that detect in meantime the somatic germline BRCA mutations and also all the other genomic instabilities. So uh, we can say that in routine, what the, both are uh, really validated that are the myriad MITROS for the BRCA and HRD. Uh, alterations, but we also have the foundation medicine, NGSSA, and how it functions. So uh, uh, as clinicians, we don't pay a lot of attention about techniques, but it's very important to, to, to mention. So you have uh, an ovarian cancer, so if you do the HRD test, this is the myriad model. If you have the BRCA mutation present, it's okay, it's mutated, but for BRCA wild type, they are capable to detect the other HRD uh, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the homologous recombination deficiencies other than beyond the BRCA, and we have three uh, main uh, drivers. So we look at the LOH, the large scale um, loss of heterozygosity, uh, also the telomeric, telomeric allelic uh, uh, imbalance, and the LCT, the large scale uh, state transitions. And for each one of those biomarkers, so we calculate the score. The HRD. In, in, in the myriad, what is the principle is to have a combined score of all those biomarkers of the three, and with this we determine a final score with the magic number or the key number of 42, which is the cutoff to say if the HRD test is positive or negative. So if you are 42 and more, it's considered an HRD positive, less it's considered HRD negative. 
Well, uh, also to say that we have both NGS Foundation and the Myriad, but we also have some other platforms that are specific to each uh, country. So we have some that are commercial, some others are academic. You have them in France, China, uh, uh, Switzerland, just to say that it sh they should be validated, have certain clinical validity to be applied also in our context of limited resources where we don't all, always have the possibility to go for a myriad of foundation. I think it's possible to have our homemade testings, but for sure they need to be validated in order to be uh, used in clinical, uh, uh, in, in routine use. Well, um, this is also important to mention, I find, because it shows when we compare uh, the genomic and stability test scores using uh, different uh, testings, here you can see that uh, uh, when you compa we compare the, the MyChoice HRD with only the LOH, we can find that 19 to 61 percent of patients can uh, be identified by, uh, by my choice HRD, but they are negative for the LOH. So if you don't go necessarily for the largest panel, you can miss some patients that have HRD, but your test is not allowing to detect them. This is also the same conclusion that we, when we go for a single HRD biomarker, we may misinform uh, treatment decisions by missing some patients that are HRD. So the message for sure is that you should go for the larger panel for uh, detecting those HRD, but in our context, I think we have the, uh, the possibility to go for, um, I, I'm not recommending to do that if you have the possibility to go for, for the myriad, for the HRD. I think in my point of view, it's the best way, but if we have uh, even, I mean, a uh, 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 smaller panel, so we can go for this prioritizing the BRCA1, BRCA2, and uh, the, the other possible HRD the, uh, uh, alterations. What is the clinical signification? I think uh, it was shown before that we have this sensitivity to platinum, to PARP inhibitor that is known, and those papers are published 20 years ago showing that those patients with BRCA mutations are eligible or have higher sensitivity to, 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 to PARP inhibitors. And uh, I don't need to remind this, so it was explained in the previous talk. So when you have a, a BRCA uh, a mutation, you have this impaired homologous recombination uh, mediated DNA repair, so leading to synthetic lethality, which make those drugs very effective in BRCA mutation, uh, BRCA mutated tumors. The proof of concept, I think, is clearly now validated. So when we uh, give PARP inhibitors, we, we know that in patients that are BRCA mutated, we have higher magnitude of benefit. I uh, put here the results from, uh, uh, from solo one study where you see here that the progression-free survival was dramatically improved, 56 uh, months versus 13 months for this metastatic or advanced setting, which is really a huge benefit. And you can uh, uh, say here that you should restrict your use to BRCA mutated patients for this uh, study with Olaparib. Same here when we look at the Paula 1 study with the maintenance, with double maintenance with uh, Olaparib and Bevacizumab, you see how is the magnitude of benefit. If you are BRCA mutated, the hazard ratio is 0.33, which means a reduction of risk of death and progression estimated at 67%, which is huge in an advanced stage. And when you move to uh, uh, HRD positive, excluding the BRCA mutations, but they, they are HRD positive, you see again that the benefit is quite interesting with a hazard ratio of 0 0.43, very important, but when you go to the HRD negative uh, or unknown population, there is no benefit of this double maintenance. What does this mean for us is that there is an efficacy in only in BRCA mutated and HRD, and in our context, I think it's very cost effective to do the testing rather than give the treatment to, to, to everybody. I think it's more to invest in testing our patients in order to spare this high costly treatment for patients who are not really getting benefit from it. Same for 
the, the, the Niraparib, we have seen uh, just a um, few moments before the, the, the study with Niraparib showing that for sure there is a benefit for all populations, so HRD, positive, negative, BRCA uh, 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 mutation uh, or not, but you can see also that the magnitude of benefit is not the same. So you have a hazard ratio 0.4 for the BRCA mutated, you have uh, 0 0.50 for the BRCA wild type, but HRD positive, and you see that this magnitude of benefit is getting smaller for the HR proficients. And I think, and also it's my own personal opinion, that if I have to prioritize in my context of limited resources, maybe I would recommend more dose treatment for patients who are BRCA mutated or HRD positive, uh, because I'm sure I'm giving the treatment for the proportion of patients who will get the max of benefit. Well, uh, once again, when you see the recommendations coming from ESMO uh, about the predictive biomarkers testing for HRD, uh, you can see that 100% of panelists, all they agree about the necessity of testing BRCA mutations, somatic and germline, also for the HRD, the same level of recommendation, 100% level of agreement about testing the HRD, uh, the, 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 the genomic instabilities and or LOH. But when it's about the other genes, so we can see that there is not enough strong data to recommend this. Well, I think one very uh, important concept for me is the ISCAT. ISCAT is the ESMO scale for clinical actionability of molecular target. What does it mean? It means that I take my targets or my drivers or my mutations and I see how it's a, a, a strong uh, evidence based to recommend this testing based on their actionability, which means that if I have a driver or mutation with data coming from phase three prospective randomized trials that shown the, the, the benefit in terms of survival, this driver, this mutation is very strong to recommend to be tested. And this is the case for BRCA mutations and HRD, and which put this, this BRCA mutation at HRD at really the highest level of the pyramid of SCAT with a score one, which is highly recommended. And for sure, it's better to see this picture of pyramid rather than the one of SCAT. So in our context of limited resources, priority should always be given to high score of ISCAT in order to, to, to test only uh, uh, the, the drivers that are uh, very actionable in clinical practice. Well, I will close my, uh, my talk with a few words about prevention. And as you know, prevention is very important uh, now uh, part of modern medicine, and I think in uh, everywhere, and specifically in limited resources countries, prevention, I think, is less costly than treating uh, the advanced disease. So uh, I think prevention should be really uh, 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 very, very, uh, I mean, high priority in our context. So I just put those guidelines recommending the screening uh, for hereditary mutations for risk assessment and genetic counseling from NCCN, from Society of Gynecologic uh, uh, Oncology, and from ASCO. They all recommend that all patients with ovarian cancer, fallopian tube cancer, or primary peritoneal cancer should be referred to uh, genetic testing for evaluation. And prevention interventions are available that can affect the cancer uh, uh, risk in the patients and their relatives. I think we would have with us uh, many surgeons here, and you know that for prevention, the risk reduction, uh, redu uh, reducing a bilateral salpangoophorectomy for patients with BRCA mutations is to be discussed. So for women at high risk of ovarian cancer based on uh, the family history and BRCA1 or 2 mutations, and they should Discussed, be discussed for uh, this, uh, this kind of surgery. We know that it reduced the risk of ovarian, uh, of uh, related gynecologic cancer by 96%. And in premenopausal women also, it reduced the risk of developing to the breast cancer by 50 to 80%. For the low risk, it should be discussed with the patients. It's not mandatory for all patients, but it should be discussed. And randomized trials are, are needed to support this approach. So I think my, my final thoughts are that the testing for germline mutations is important 
to determine the prognosis and identify uh, the, the, the family members at high risk of developing cancer because it's very important to have this preventive approach that will be for us less costly than treating those uh, patients with those very costly drugs. And also, uh, the patient counseling is an important component of genetic testing. Don't hesitate to, to, to send your patient to, for genetic counseling. And I think in our limited resources countries, we have to prioritize the most cost-effective drugs with better selection of patients, better to select patients by testing the drivers than giving the drug to everybody. And also, we have all to fight, I think, in our context for having those testings available in our countries, even why not to think about our homemade testings, and also don't forget the role of prevention and risk family assessment. Thank you.